Hello! Today's stories come from r slash malicious compliance. Today is a malicious compliance burger with a heavy dose of juice right in the middle. Our first mixes malicious compliance with youthful innocence in. You want your magazine? Fine, I'll deliver it right to your hand. Recently, I, a 15-year-old female, started getting complaints on the paper round I work. I work a paper round for extra income since I'm not 16 yet and legally in the UK cannot get a proper job. I've had it for two years. Lately though, about two months or so, I got a new house on the round and they've been nothing but a pain. Not only is it out the way of my round, so pretty much a hassle to get to, they have to be very rude too. Lately, my boss has been forgetting to put magazines into the papers and they've constantly been complaining resulting in me getting reprimanded. That in itself isn't bad, but they've yelled at me for not closing their gate properly, getting too close to their ring doorbell, and waving at their child from the window in the morning. All things that led to this malicious compliance. Five weeks ago, however, they were still complaining about getting no magazine despite me making sure before I delivered that it went through and I was getting tired. The next time I delivered their papers, I knocked. Bear in mind, I have to get these papers delivered quickly, so it was 6 a.m. at this point. However, I knocked and knocked until the wife of the grumpy guy opened the door, half asleep and looking agitated. She coughs slightly, and in a typical Karen voice, she goes, What the hell do you want? I look at her with fake stun, as if I don't know what I'm doing, and tell her, I'm just delivering the magazine like you asked. At this moment, she knew she couldn't complain because, one, her ring doorbell caught it all, And two, I had physically handed it to her this time. Undeniable proof. For the next upcoming weeks, I knocked until they answered the door, making sure to knock extra loud. This morning, however, the husband answered the door and he looked defeated. He flat out looked at me and apologized. In his words, at least, we get it. We're sorry about the complaints. Please stop knocking so early and just get the paper through the door. After that long round, nothing felt more satisfactory than the sweet taste of malicious compliance. I may be underpaid, but it was all worth it to see that face. Short and sweet. Amazing. Feigning eagerness is really icing on a malicious compliance cake, am I right? Kill them with kindness. That's what I used to tell myself when I dealt with awful customers. Anyway, let's head over to the comments where OP adds a little extra flavor to the story. 87 Lonely Girl said, You learned a valuable lesson that some adults never do. Manners cost nothing, and the poetic justice of giving someone exactly what they want can be so much better than getting yourself worked up. This will be a story you tell for decades to come. OP replied, Thank you. Hopefully, I'll have a lot more malicious compliance to come. People on these rounds are all pretty entitled when it comes to getting their papers on time. (laughs) Watermelon Artist added, I remember a customer who would call in a missed delivery every time his wife took it to work, a wet paper every time it rained, regardless of how many bags I wrapped it in. I figured it out when I got two complaints in the same day from them. Wife said it was wet, husband said it was undelivered. None of them cared that an 11-year-old kid was eating the cost of their entitlement. CFWY Dirk said, you will do well in life, young woman. Give them what they ask for. Miguel and Leguiam said, sow the fields with their blood. No, wait, that's step 13. You good. Brett added step 14, surprisingly, is a picnic. Snowtap said, who in their right minds complains that the 15-year-old is waving at their kid? Unless, of course, you were in a clown costume and the hand you used waving wasn't your own. OP said, in her words, I was distracting her precious boy from his Peppa Pig. Amory Thorne said, oh no, not human interaction when he should be watching TV. Our second story is hefty, so get ready for a big bite. We start with, Oh, you think the trade shows are actually vacations wrought with fraud and you want to impose strict controls over a business you don't understand? Good luck. Many years ago, I worked for a company that hired an incredibly obtuse financial department who took over when they first organized. It used to be a loose collection of managers, but the year after I started, they went for a more organized and separate structure. To be fair, this is more about my boss than myself. We had a travel team, a group of volunteers from sales and IT, who would go en masse with equipment and text to do setups, displays, and network at trade shows. We had a booth, some sales guys would be there, and networking would commence. 
there was always a set of volunteers from the IT department because some of the shows would be in big cities. You get to attend vendor events, parties, and hang out with the sales guys, who were mostly gay alcoholics for some reason, and super fun. There was a kind of seniority to who got to volunteer, but nobody really complained, and everyone got rotated who got to go. You got to go to DEF CON last year. It's my turn now. Okay, fair. The travel team a lead was also a volunteer position, but commonly someone high up, like a manager. Their job was to orchestrate equipment, rentals, expenses, travel plans, convention center fees, and shipping. They also ended up getting a lot of free stuff too, from sales and our partners, which they'd pass along to the travel team. It was all kind of a perk, to be fair, for everyone involved. But when the new director of finance started, she put in some new and strict policies. Some of their policies started with, travel team is not allowed to get reimbursed without explicit approval and nobody was approved post-event. Travel team does not get a credit card of their own or even a company card. Travel team gets gift cards for a set amount, like $150, which was to be used for all expenses. Sadly, places we needed it for like airlines, rental agencies, hotel rooms, gas pumps, and toll booths do not accept gift cards. Finance denied these were gift cards and even specifically disallowed people in meetings to refer to them as such. Pre-approved credit balances, I think we had to say. But to the rest of the world, they were 100% exactly the same as gift cards with gift card restrictions. No matter how early you asked for it, often finance waited until the very, very last minute, and usually after half a dozen reminders to get anything approved, which incurred a lot of unnecessary costs, like expedited shipping, same-day rental penalties, or inflated airfares. If they forgot, it was your fault or your manager's fault for not reminding them enough. Okay, you reminded them four times to buy the team airline tickets, and it wasn't done? Should have reminded them five times, so your fault. This was all in response to the director of finance's claim it would reduce fraud, an issue that, as far as anyone could tell, had never happened. The director had this Dolores Umbridge approach that somebody somewhere might get away with something. She was a patronizing git with a smug grin and this annoying head waggle when she downsplained something to you. So we'll call her Dolores. Before her, the travel team would just submit receipts and get reimbursed. Dolores put an end to that, specifically saying the previous lead of the travel team was just going to spend all the money on steaks and wine. He understandably told her to go get stuffed and quit the company when the dust settled. In his wake, Dolores used his free stuff from vendors as a shining example of stolen opulence and swag hoarding that she put an end to. Oh, behold the mighty on his throne of airborne express stress squishies and free Uline catalogs. That left my manager to take over his duties, and he'd never done travel team, so he wasn't really sure how it all worked and didn't push back on Dolores at first, until he was forced to travel with the team. He was surprised he didn't have an expense account or corporate card, and when he asked for one, he got the gift card. When he tried to use it, it was rejected pretty much everywhere he needed it, except various restaurants. He paid for everything else on his personal American Express card, including stuff for the rest of the team, and was rejected for reimbursements because he didn't ask for it beforehand. He was on the hook for 40k plus in various things from two-week-long trips. Of course, he complained to the top management. Dolores threatened to quit if she wasn't allowed to do her job, and the top managers never had to deal with her before, and were kind of wishy-washy about being the bad guy here. Like, well, she says she lets you use gift cards, so... And when my manager said they were rejected, Dolores said, He's not trying hard enough. He's afraid of confrontation. He needs to be a big boy and fight back. But in the end, the top management reimbursed him under pressure from the legal department. After that happened, Dolores settled on having certain things prepaid for, like hotel, travel, truck rentals, and shipping. But they waited so long to do them that often they tried to get hotel rooms or truck rental the day of a popular event, sold out, or got the wrong hotel. Washington, D.C. is not the same as Washington State. Or waited so long for shipping, it cost $250 to send something overnight that would have cost $40 to send it a few weeks prior. They also didn't understand how much anything actually cost, and how we save money by doing things ourselves. And in some cases, finance did everything wrong. So the team would arrive at the right hotel and found out that finance didn't submit an authorized approval for a card for, say, incidentals, a requirement for most hotels for trade shows. And nobody could reach them. So again, 
people got dinged on their personal cards. Again, Dolores said, they just can't accept what the hotel desk convention center union or dumb minimum wage bunny at the toll booth tells them. They have to fight back. We can't spoon feed and coddle these guys because they are too scared of conflict. Ever fight with a Jersey Turnpike toll booth collector? Yeah, neither had she. After two of these disasters, my manager said, just stop. Stop volunteering for these events. I will not approve time off for it. He declined being travel lead for future trips because he just couldn't afford it. This was an unpopular move at best, but he told us, just wait. Let her do things her way. He was a master at malicious compliance, and with no resistance, Dolores went into fifth gear with a smug grin. Now we're going to act like a real company. That leads to the next issue. Some of these travels were in major cities like Chicago, New York City, Washington, D.C., etc. Dolores, again, said that people were just going to these events to get the company to pay for a drinking vacation. Management was like, uh, yeah, we wouldn't get volunteers otherwise. Well, Dolores didn't like that idea. So she decided that she would hold a staff lottery and you could enter your name and she'd have a drawing on who got to go to be fair to everyone. This fairness seems awfully slanted on her own staff, by the way, which we'll get to shortly. The point of these trade shows was not to take a vacation, something Dolores made absolutely sure to point out. But she didn't grasp the entire reason we went, to increase our business. It had to be IT folk for setup and sales folk for the schmoozing, but that concept never got past her ears into her cognitive understanding. Well, since both IT and tech folk, who already couldn't go, didn't want to pay for it, we didn't volunteer. So the travel team ended up being other company staff who had no idea how to work, act, or deal with trade shows, which was a horrific expense disaster. Imagine the administrative assistant for marketing on the fifth floor winning a ticket, only to find out she had to pay for everything. Plus, Dolores always sent one of her own to keep an eye on everyone. But none of them knew how trade shows worked either. They only knew how to kowtow to Dolores and her control issues. What is a union fee? What is corkage? No, I did not approve some union to give us power. You plug your boost stuff into an outlet or something. They won't let you. Who is they? Well, then stop using TV screens in the booth. You don't need them. We do not sell TVs anyway. Did you know that if you have a conflict with an event center union and decline their help, they charge you anyway at max rate? Yeah, Dolores and her team didn't know that either. And let me tell you, paying those guys a few thousand bucks ahead of time is a lot cheaper than just letting them charge you fines afterwards. Oh, she tried to fight back because she was not afraid of a little conflict, but lost heavily. Ironically, despite Dolores stating otherwise at great length, the non-IT or salespeople who went actually thought it was company paid vacation-ish, just like Dolores warned about, making it a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. The fact they had to work was surprising at first. Then after that word got out, nobody would enter into the lottery. So now they had no volunteers. So Dolores assigned them to interns. Interns! I could write an entire novel from that disaster alone. Imagine sending a bunch of college kids to Vegas, telling them they had to pay for things, and putting them in a job conflict situation where they were guaranteed to lose. I'm sure many laws were broken. Dolores then had to send along chaperones to manage it, who were more of her finance department flunkies, and our company ended up with massive fines for various issues, including paying bail for the interns. Because the interns got into so much trouble, Dolores started hiring room monitors for the hotels and fully legal adults had to go to the show, work the entire day at the show on their feet, then check back into their room. She also put four to six people to a room too, like they were a high school band or something. She even had breathalyzers bought for it to make sure nobody was drinking. Adults. She treated adults like this. This was brought up by the sales teams as a PR nightmare and my boss said, just wait, okay? let her hang herself. The first year of this, the travel team's expenses increased by over 4,000%. You heard me, 4,000%. Trips that used to cost $3,600 were now costing 144 k or more. Often because of last minute fees and penalties, the travel team expenses went from 110 k annual on average to over 2 point something million. Because everything was so badly mishandled, we lost a lot of our booth slots and booth renewals. So we lost half our trade shows and looked like idiots to our clients. But the main reason we went to those trade shows in the first place was for networking. So there was literally no reason to go anymore. This was pointed out to Dolores multiple times by the sales team. So she doubled down and canceled the travel team after just one year. 
Finally, top management got involved, who actually fought with Dolores for a year until she retired for personal reasons to dedicate herself to her family. Then it took nearly two years to rebuild the travel team from scratch. People got corporate cards, travel team lead became an actual job, and when we hired one, she handled all the financial stuff for us. So it was much better and saved the company a ton of money in her first year. And there was much rejoicing. Edit. So some edits based on some common questions. Question. You're really talking about so-and-so, aren't you? Answer. There are a lot of Dolores Umbridges out there, apparently. Only three people, former co-workers, got it right. Question. Why was she not fired when the spending went from 110k to 2.1 mil? Answer. Several reasons. The biggest being she was director of finance. So I am sure when she gave her fiscal report, she downplayed the mistakes. We also had some really good years in the early 2000s. If we made 2 million in profit the previous year and 3 million the next, that loss would have gone unnoticed until someone realized we should have made 6 million instead. That's my theory at any rate, based on the aftermath. Dolores was friends of two of the top managers and supposedly had a come to Jesus meeting with them about the state of our company's financial standings. So that's why they hired her in the first place. By the second year, several directors had quit, including friends of top management, who took them for drinks later and got the entire scoop. Dolores has got to go. The trade show thing was only one of the cases she messed up. She also completely hosed one of our major supply chains by lowballing them and making a few enemies that nearly destroyed the company and gave away some of our more lucrative contracts with vendors to competitors because that broke their anti-competitive clauses. There were more issues, but that comes closer to identifying some people, which is a huge no-no here. Question. What happened to the Christmas party? Answer. The Christmas party wasn't nearly as interesting. She just didn't have one. This was near the tail end of the whole, now we're going to run this like a real company, fiasco. But once the budget for events was 2.1 million from 110k, the Christmas party was probably far down her list of worries. I don't even think she knew she was supposed to have one. Some people think she was funneling that money to cover up the massive expense increase for the trade show fiascos. But I can't imagine that those budgets were from the same pool. I think around November, people started asking, don't they have a holiday party every year? But nobody knew who was doing it. Usually, the three people who were a huge part of it in previous years were no longer with the company. They had quit, mostly because of Dolores. But even they didn't run it, per se. They hired and catered it out of some fancy hotel locally. Our fiscal year was Jan to December, so December was huge for tying things up, and this was her first year running fiscal year-end stuff. She came on board late in the previous year, and so the finance team would have been normally very occupied anyway. Question, how was she let go? Answer, she just gained too many enemies in the company. It took a while, but after she had been with us for a year and a half, she accumulated too much negative drag on her inertia to get things done because there started to be a very strong passive resistance. This caused her to spiral out of control and to try to start a coup which gained no traction and singled her out as being mildly unhinged to say the least. By the time her second anniversary came and went, she started taking sabbaticals until one of them became permanent. Her assistant took over but then was let go and they brought in some consultant group who started a new financial team. They were the ones that suggested someone have the travel team lead as an actual separate paid job. The woman who got hired and ran that was amazing. Question. Is it true she tried to sell keychains and pens? Answer. No one asked this, but a former co-worker reminded me that she was appalled we were just giving away some of our normal booth freebies like stickers, pens, t-shirts, and keychain flashlights. She demanded we charge at least a nominal fee for them, but nobody followed that mandate. I only personally know she sent out a memo admonishing employees that a lot of the keychains went missing and she was seeing them on people's desks. Those cost the company money and wanted to charge employees $3 for them, but apparently she wanted to charge people at the booth as well. Decree number 24. All employees shall pay $3 for advertising on our behalf when donning the company logo on their keychain. Jeez, this woman sounds like a nightmare. I'm surprised more people didn't quit. Sounds like this wasn't OP's boss's first rodeo, though. He knew Dolores was being given enough rope to hang herself. Let's check out the comments where OP explains why this woman may have been in her role for as long as she was. Junior Freddy said, It floors me how in these cases upper management can't see that this person is subtracting value from the company. Did she not have a boss asking her to explain why a 4K expense turned into 144K? Why not? 
Sometimes people make mistakes or unexpected things happen. But the second time this happened, she should have been a threat away from firing. We can't afford to pay you because we're paying for all your mistakes. The fact that she had that much rope to hang herself with is some pretty colossal mismanagement from the executive team. OP replied, It's been nearly two decades, but IIRC, she has a friend of a friend who got a lot of their financial stuff organized and up to regulatory standards. That's why they were hesitant, because she could take her football and go home, so to speak. But after a lot of these incidents, where she prevented teams from doing their jobs and dropping the ball on our annual Christmas party, they were like, we got to do something about Dolores. Idiot Cobalt said, stop using TV screens in the booth. Fracken sent me. The event team in the company I used to be with was a dedicated part of the marketing department, and for a small show, they either denied or forgot to have a screen ship for the sales director who was representing the company at the show. So Homeboy went to the local Best Buy and bought one to use at the booth. They don't sell TVs. What do they think people use to advertise their products or services on? Pamphlets? Last trade event I went to, the Keystone booth at the show, had multiple massive screens simply suspended above their booth broadcasting their logo. And that was in Chicago, so it was all union work for the riggers, gaffers, electricians, gophers, and anyone else who made it happen. Abe Broman Kingsaw said, I proposed campus Wi-Fi for eight years for our travel tourism business. Each time, my boss replied, we are not a data company. Apprehensive employee said, I bet they use gasoline and electricity without being an oil or power company. Our last story was one of the top stories of the last month. It is titled, Boss says I can't come in early to set up my cart. So I come in right at clock in. Coworker who leaves early gets mad at me. So this happened back in 2015 through 2016. I, now 28-year-old female, was working as a phlebotomist in a local hospital and I worked first shift, which was about 3 a.m. to 3 p.m. I loved to come in about 10 to 15 minutes early and just set up my cart, nothing fancy, just metal wired shelving types, and we had our own personal phlebotomist trays that we put in the top section of the cart. I didn't always restock my tray before leaving my shift, so I typically come in early to organize it and get my metal cart ready. It usually took me maybe five minutes to put my tray on a cart and put the handful of tubes I needed back in place. Then I'd spend the rest of my time waking up in the break room with coffee. Well, one woman, can't remember her age, who came into work a few months after I started and I, had issues. I found her lazy and rude. Examples. She would come in and snap at people when they tried to help her. She would take a book with her during morning rush, which was 3 a.m. to 6 or 7 a.m., and sit on the floor to read and not come back to the lab to help after collecting her labs. She would hang out during the nurses' celebrations and not come back for hours at a time. She wouldn't clock in until the last second, and then she'd clock out the earliest minute she could. When it was time to start the morning rush, she'd get mad if someone took the stack of labs she wanted, and she'd go demanding them. She and I worked the same overnight shift, but I got tired of her attitude and switched shifts. Like I said, I like to come early and set up my cart before I clocked in. And she figured this out quickly. So she would try to hand me the stroke or trauma pager, something that needed to be handed to the next phlebotomist, who was scheduled to take it that shift. But she'd try to give me hers even if I wasn't scheduled for that one. But I refused, saying, I'm not clocked in yet. So she just left it on my cart a few times without telling me, which led to it going off for a call to the ER and I had to clock in early, and when I saw her in the lab again, I told her to never do that again. The conversation got heated, which led to a meeting with me, the coworker, and our supervisor. Our supervisor took her side and said, just take it, and if it goes off, you clock in, and then I will adjust the clock in on the computer, saying she'd shorten my time on the clock. So I said, fine. I set my alarm for later in the morning, and I started coming in the last minute I could to clock in at 2.59 a.m., Yes, it made me start my rush a little later, but the look on my coworker's face when she saw me later, right before she was to clock out, as she was trying to hand me a pager I wasn't scheduled to have, and I already had the one I was supposed to, was priceless. She complained to the supervisor who tried to talk to me, but I said, well, I'm not supposed to be here until three, so that's when I get here and clock in now. I don't want my hours messed up. She didn't even try to argue. The coworker was very upset. She even screamed through the lab, demanding someone take her pager so she could go home. It was still 20 minutes until her shift was done. I find it a little unnerving that a woman like this is drawing blood from people. She is in the wrong profession. OP's approach is spot on. Who the heck wants to tack on an extra 20 minutes to their shift on account of someone else's laziness? 
I mean, helping someone out in a jam is one thing, but covering for someone else's shortcomings is ridiculous. And that supervisor is just an enabler. Ugh. Let's check out some fun comments on the medical industry. Commander Issue said, It always blows my mind people like this don't get told to get fracked more often. The Flying Sheep said, The staffing shortages work both ways, sadly. We were desperate for phlebotomists, so crappy ones like the coworker are kept until they seriously frack up. A walk to Jericho added, Well, managers need to learn to step up and manage the crappy workers to make the good workers not leave their jobs. They end up using really bad parenting techniques that are proven not to work. Simple Percentage shared, Assuming you're in the US, your manager is trying to time shape, which is extremely illegal. Good on you for standing up for yourself. OP replied, Yep, I'm in the US. I knew what she was saying was illegal, but I didn't want to verbally say anything about it. So I just started complying with my scheduled hours. Ended up getting extra sleep. Jafin's Wake said, It's always surprising to me how unprofessional people can be in medicine. I had a shift last week where a paramedic who doesn't normally work our shift felt the need to lecture everyone on their history of PTSD and traumas. Blows my mind how people can act like that. Ashley Bear said, I had a paramedic scream at me to put my mask back on while I was actively puking. He even tried to tell the nurses that I was just being dramatic. His partner looked mortified about him saying that and told him to back off, and he wouldn't. The nurses on the L&D floor where I was did not take kindly to that, especially because I had told them in between puking that I have hyperemesis gravidarum and had caught a stomach virus from my kid. I have never seen nurses purposely come into a room to cuss someone out until that day. I sent those nurses a huge muffin basket after I was discharged. If you've enjoyed the story and would like to hear more, consider liking, subscribing, and leaving a comment. Thanks, and bye for now.